Hi, my name is Michael, and this is a beginner's tutorial for TNET3. When you import TNET into your project, you will find a new folder called TNET, and inside of it is all the content for TNET. All the examples can be found under the examples folder, and underneath there's documentation and scenes for you to look at. The scene you should start with is the menu scene, and you should make sure that the scenes have been added to uh, the build settings so they can actually be started and loaded properly. So anyhow, the menu scene. The menu scene is what's used to enter other scenes, so it's a good place to start. You can go into other scenes directly and actually play around with them, and it is going to work just fine. TNET doesn't require an active online connection for things to work. The same code you write for multiplayer will work just fine for single player. But anyway, back to the menu scene. When you hit play on the menu scene, you will have a few choices here. Connect will connect to an existing server. Starting a LAN server will do just that, it will create a LAN server that others can connect to. Starting a virtual server will start a local server that uh, will not be opening any sockets or anything like that. It is essentially exactly what it says. It's a virtual server that will only exist on the computer that you run it on. It's great for implementing things like save game functionality without adding full-blown multiplayer. So I'll just go ahead and start a virtual server here. Up top you will notice some debug logs that are coming through that let me know that I've actually connected, but I can actually see that by the fact that the menu shows up here listing all the other scenes that I've uh, added. So uh, RFC scene is what you just saw a few seconds ago. It uh, basically lets you change the colors of the cube by clicking on that cube. You can go back to the menu and re-enter the scene and Everything here is going to be persistent. That is because the scene was actually created as a persistent scene, but more on that later. Speaking of saving things, if you happen to disconnect, stop the server, restart the server, go back to the scene, you'll notice that the changes you've made in that scene are still here. Let's try this again. Make them red, disconnect, stop. Uh, I'll even stop Unity, hit play, virtual server, RFCs, the changes are still here. And that's because uh, TNET will automatically save uh, the result into a file and load this file back up. This is how the save game functionality can be created using TNET without any additional work on your part. So multiplayer and save game functionality works exactly the same. There's really nothing for the user to do to get this to work. In order to start a local server and connect to it, which is something you would do in a single player game, you would call TN server instance start, specifying a file name to load, and then immediately connect to it, thus establishing a connection with that virtual server. When you shut down the server using TN server instance stop later on, it'll automatically save everything into the same file name. TNET will also periodically save uh, the file for you, just in case. So how does this magic work, you might ask? Well, in a typical game, what you would do is just call a function directly and uh, specify some parameter to it. With TNET, what you do instead is you specify the RFC prefix to the function and then you send the function call. So instead of calling it directly, like so, you send the function call to all the connected players. In this case, I'm specifying the target as all saved, which means that all the clients, including the one I am on, will receive this function call. So I will receive the same function call I'm sending to all the other players. It also says saved here, which means that this function gets saved on a server. So as soon as the server uh, receives it, it will save it. And if the server happens to shut down and then reloads back up, the function will still be there. Also, if the player, if a new player happens to join a channel, they will automatically receive this function call right away before the scene finishes the loading process. So this is how you actually have a persistent state. 
object instantiation is done using a similar kind of method. So instead of the RFC prefix, which is a remote function call, I use an RCC prefix, which is a remote creation call. This identifies the function as a creation function. And when I call TN manager instantiate, which is what I would use to create an object, not object instantiate that you would use normally in a single player game, but TN manager instantiate. I am uh, calling this function, which you can find right here, and I'm specifying a bunch of parameters. In this case, these are the parameters. Prefab name is the name of the game object inside the resources folder that I am going to be instantiating. When Tnet receives this function call, it will automatically load this object and pass it as a reference to the prefab itself. True means it's going to be persistent in this case. It's just the flag specifying that the object will remain in the scene even if the player leaves. If you're creating a player avatar, for example, you would specify a false here instead. So as soon as the player leaves, the avatar will vanish. But in this case, I'm specifying a true. So uh, back to the example here. Colored object is the function, which happens to be a static function. It uh, does not belong to any class and it can be executed from anywhere, which is important in the case of instantiation. So the prefab will be passed to you by Tnet and all the parameters that you've specified, which should match the parameters specified in a function call, will be here uh, as if you pass them directly to the function itself. From that point onward, in this case, all I'm doing is just doing prefab instantiate, creating an instance of it, and instantiate is an extension method, one of the extension methods that comes with Tnet. I'm specifying a position, rotation, and I'm specifying a color as well. The parameters, the number of parameters is completely arbitrary. You can specify any parameters you want. Anything that can be serialized can be passed as a parameter. Tnet doesn't really care. It's up to you. In this case, I'm also going to be calling destroy self, which means that the object will destroy itself automatically after a specific uh, amount of time has passed. It's, it's just like calling object uh, destroy, uh, pass, uh, passing some game object, and then a time after which it should be destroyed. It's the same exact idea, except in this case, it'll be destroyed on all the connected clients at the same time, not just locally, which is important to have. The destroy self is actually an extension, like another extension that comes with Tnet, and it will work exactly the same whether this object was dynamically instantiated or is just a local object. In either case, destroy self can be used to destroy the object either locally or remotely. Tnet comes in a complete source code form written in C-sharp. So if something doesn't work or if you aren't sure about something, you can always examine the source code and change it if you like. It also comes with a standalone server, which is a standalone executable pre-compiled for you, which does not require Unity at all. In this case, it's only 165 kilobytes in size and it can be launched anywhere. The amount of resources the standalone server requires is absolutely minimal. In Winward, I've actually had players running servers on a Raspberry Pi, for example. That's how lightweight it is. One of the new features in uh, Tnet3 is called a data node. A data node is a class similar to an XML tree where you have a node that has a value and it can have an arbitrary number of children. And those children can have values of their own and children of their own. You get the point. It's extremely flexible. It can store any amount of data in it and it can easily retrieve this data using an easy to use templated function. It can also store its data in uh, text format, which you can see on the right hand side here when it's saved to a file, in binary format, or even in LZMA compressed format for ultimate size reduction. You can even store entire game object hierarchies inside a data node and export them to a file. In Winward, I've actually used data node based export for modding purposes. So I would export an entire model into a data node uh, binary format 
and upload it to the server. When players would connect to the server, they would automatically download these additional files, the modded content, and just load them up themselves. So I was able to add things like new ships, uh, new particle effects, new textures, all without having to modify the actual game itself. Data node is also extremely useful for providing a variable number of parameters. In this case, it shows an example of a typical function that has a fixed number of parameters. The problem with that is when it gets saved to a file, the fixed number of parameters has to stay the same. If you happen to add an additional parameter later on during development, you would have to create a new function or risk breaking the loading functionality of existing save files. If you were to use a data node, on the other hand, this would work natively. You can add children to it and pass default values for objects that do not exist yet. Very handy to have. TNet has three levels of data nodes on the player, on the channel, and on the server itself. Server based data node can be used like this TN Manager set server data, and you can retrieve it using TN Manager get server data. You can uh, uh, retrieve a single value, or you can retrieve a value inside a path somewhere. Again, very handy to have in general. Server-based data node is ideal for things like server-wide configurations. So in case of Winward, I would specify what kind of ships there are available on the server, how much they cost, uh, what resources are available in the world, what the world settings are, whether PvP is enabled, and so on and so forth. That is server-wide data, and it can be saved a set like this. The next level is the channel data. A channel in uh, TNet is like a different chat room. Players can be present in one or more channels or in no channels even. And it's basically a means of uh, separating traffic on the server side so that you're not sending data to all the players connected to the server, but instead you're only sending the data to the players that should actually be receiving this data. But in any case, TN Manager set channel data can be used to set the data on this channel, and TN Manager get channel data can be used to retrieve the data on this channel. So if this was a chat room, for example, you might want to be able to set the name of this channel. And you can actually do that. You can set additional properties as well. And if somebody was to request a list of all the channels, they would get this data that comes with this channel alongside so they would be able to see the name of this channel that you've set previously. Calling the set and get, by the way, will automatically synchronize it with all the other players present, and it will also save the values on the server, if the channel happens to be persistent. The last part is reading and writing player data. TN Manager set player data, TN Manager get player data. Exactly as you would have guessed. Except there is one difference. In this case, set player data can only set the data for the player that you currently are. So this means you cannot modify the values of other players. You can retrieve the values of other players by using the player reference to begin with, though. So if you were to use TN Manager get player and specify the idea of the player you would be able to then retrieve the values on that player. So for things that are player specific, such as their name, their inventory, their guild, things like that, you would be specifying on the player. One other thing I should mention, if you actually set a player save like that, using TN Manager set player save, then TNet will take care of both loading the player data from that save file as well as automatically saving the player data to that save file every time you change the player's properties. This is the easiest way of creating saved game functionality for the player itself. If you've played a game called Terraria, for example, the player file there was separate from the world save file. And this is how you do something like that. 
But in any case, if you want to know more, just check the player data tutorial that comes with TNET. Back to the data node though. You can actually save entire game object hierarchies inside a data node. Data node can be used to export just about anything. You can export prefabs, you can export game objects, you can even export textures if you want. And when exporting game objects, by the way, or exporting prefabs for that matter, TNET will automatically figure out what should be included in the bundle itself and what shouldn't. Meaning, if something is inside a resources folder, then TNET will just save a reference to it instead of exporting it. While if something is not in the resources folder, meaning it cannot be loaded dynamically, TNET will actually include that data inside. So if you were to export a model, for example, TNET would save the mesh information, the texture information, the material information, and all the other stuff inside the data node. To serialize a game object into data node format, you just use gameobject.serialize extension. This will create a data node that you can then write to a file if you want, or upload it to the server, which is really handy for things like server-side mods. You can also read the object later at any time, either right away, locally, or by loading it from the server. And then you can instantiate this game object easily by simply calling the instantiate function on the data node itself. In Winward, after uploading a file, I also leave an appropriate entry inside the server data structure. So I use TM Manager, set server data, and I specify uploads and the name of the file. So as soon as the new players connect, they receive the server data, they check all the files that they have locally against what should be on the server, and if they don't have some files, they just download it using TN Manager load file. Simple. One other cool feature in TNet3 is the ability to join several channels at the same time. In this case, the example that comes from TNet allows you to drive around the scene, and as you get far away from a channel, the client automatically leaves it, and all the objects belonging to that channel disappear. This lets you partition your world into different regions that you can automatically enter and leave as you get close or far away. This is the ideal way of partitioning your world and reducing the amount of traffic uh, that you have to send out. There is a lot more, of course, but uh, I think it's time to wrap up this video. I hope you now have a good understanding of what TNET is capable of and how you can make use of it in your own projects. And as usual, since TNET comes in full source code form, you can examine exactly what it does and how it does it. The source code is fully commented for your enjoyment. Thanks for watching and have an awesome day.